Walk us through what you saw on August 20th, Detective Vega said. I couldn't help but shrink back in the foldable metal chair to try and distance myself from the two investigators who sat across from me in the colorless interrogation room. The first individual was roughly 28 years old, but his demeanor was one of pure confidence, which may have been false bravado since he had likely not paid his dues. His youth gave that suspicion away. The second was older with a silver mustache and cold blue eyes. They both had on shimmering wristwatches which had to be far above their pay grade, probably gifts from their badge bunnies. Seems as though you're treating me as a suspect, I said. Outside of a minor consuming charge on prom night, I've never been in trouble. We're not presuming anything negative against you. The second man who identified himself as Edwards said as he straightened his tie. There's no evidence you had anything to do with what appeared on your porch that night. It was a bizarre scene and we're trying to cover every angle of it to form a better understanding. It's for the sake of the way the case gets written up and presented in court. We want to make the community feel better with a conclusion. There's no hidden agenda here, Vega said. I want to help. I mean, it's disturbed me to the point where even my therapist is concerned. I did not share the rest of the facts about how my shrink had opined that, since the incident, I had been partaking in activities that signaled persistent lashing out due to an unconscious death wish. Speeding in busy neighborhoods around blind spots that no reasonable person would do. Going swimming at 2am after a few whiskey sours. I lost my temper with complete disregard for whether the verbal altercation would lead to a physical one. And most importantly, I voluntarily showed up at the police station to share my side of the story when I had not even been requested there. We're here to listen, Edward said. I saw a vending machine down the hallway. Bring me a coffee and I'll tell you everything. My house is a three-story estate in the middle of the desert. The solitude of the property is what made me purchase it off Zillow. I had made enough money to become a homeowner, an achievement that I never believed possible until I climbed rank within an aerospace company and I had saved up enough to get out of a decrepit and overpriced department in the city. The first four months of residing there, my life was busy but otherwise peaceful, until my relationship had ended. She and I are still friends, but she, whose name I would prefer to leave out of this, had a psychotic ex-boyfriend with a history of stalking her. Due to this, I set up an extensive home surveillance system when we were still together, and even after we had separated, I kept the monitoring of the premises operational, even though it cost me a monthly sum. Cameras and motion sensor detectors are mounted at every part of the building. My security app went off one time when I was at my desk, since I work from home most days. I brought up the indicated screen on my computer and found a mountain lion roaming by. It was quite a shocking sight to behold, but I was happy that it was not a home invader. For several weeks, I kept my head down and focused on my job. My social life became relatively non-existent and my romantic one even less so. I wanted to prove to my superiors that they made the right choice in giving me the new and better paying title at work. I became obsessed with being the best in my company, not only regionally, but nationwide. My app went off again on August 20th. I was so dedicated to completing my assignment that day that I didn't even think to bring up the camera since I reasoned it was likely wildlife or a glitch. A bat sometimes flew by and the creature's flapping wings would cause the alerts in my phone to go haywire. My better senses kicked in and I retrieved my phone and checked out the framed image of what had activated the notification. A man sat on my porch. He wore dark khaki pants and was shirtless. Blood streamed from both of his wrists. Knives of many varieties were placed in a nearby perfect circle around him. I stood and stared at the screen in open-mouthed terror. A chill ran through me as I reached for my phone to call 911. 
It was dead and it had been for hours. I was so caught up in the menial task of my 9 to 5 that I forgot to charge it. I decided to do the only thing that I could think of which was to help him. Regardless of how strange everything on the monitor appeared, I didn't want him dying on me. I was raised by two good people who taught me to assist the less fortunate whenever possible. I went downstairs and opened a kitchen cabinet to grab some plastic gloves. I vaguely remembered some tips from a CPR course that I took in college when I had a job as a security guard. I pilfered through the cabinets in the ground level bathroom as well and found a black gauze pad. I slowly crept out onto the porch. The man did not acknowledge me or turn around to face me, even when the sound of my footsteps seemed deafening in the silence of the night. A harvest moon was in the sky. As I got closer, I heard the individual groan as he laboriously rocked back and forth. An earthly and sweet smell met my nose and I realized that he had burned some sage. Salt also surrounded him. He had black hair and his torso was covered in tattoos, the majority of them Roman Catholic depictions of religious iconography. When I was less than four feet away from him, I moved to the front where I could try and make eye contact, but he still did not raise his head. I try not to panic, I said. My phone is juicing up right now. I'll call for help as soon as it's in the green. I'm going to apply pressure to your wounds to stop the bleeding, okay? He did not agree or rebel against my statement, but let out a whimper as he moved lightly again with a swaying motion. I got onto my knees and wrapped both of his wrists and held down on the material until they were soaked through. Hold still, I said as I applied another level of bandaging. I tied both of them off and went upstairs again and called emergency medical services. There's no chest pain and there's nobody else but him out there. Any weapons at the scene? I knew the question was a routine one for a dispatcher to ask, but I wasn't sure of how to answer it. Yes, ma'am, but it looks like he's more interested in collecting and carrying them around with him rather than using them. I finally answered with a yes but informed her that he seemed incapable of wielding the blades with lethal intent. Somebody is on their way, she said. I went out again and I faced the person. I wrapped his wrists in fresh gauze again. This is what it wants, he said. It took a while for me to process his words. You stated the knives were in a circle around him. Detective Vega asked. Yes, I said, almost like a ritualistic sphere of some kind. I guess you could. Detective Vega pulled out a cream-colored folder with a thick stack of papers in it. We confiscated your computer and had cyber crimes go through your cloud. You seem obsessed with the occult. That's a pathetic excuse for a gotcha moment. I was under the impression that I had the right to freedom of belief. I don't think it's very relevant to my account of what happened either. You never got a warrant to check my computer. I gave all of you permission and you found nothing a jury would believe is incriminating. Do you guys want me to finish or should I walk out of here? I could tell that Edwards was frustrated with his partner since the callow one had used the nuclear option of presenting evidence against me way too early. I could tell that the interview was losing momentum on their end and that it was not going the way they wanted. Please do, Edward said. As I stood there and tried to keep the man alive, I knew the professionals would not show up for at least another ten minutes. I need to sit on that bench, he said as he flexed his feeble hand to form a finger and pointed at the pine piece of furniture that was located at the edge of the patio. Stay where you're at, I said. They're going to help you feel better soon. There's no such thing, he said as he stared at me for the first time. As feeling better, we all carry the same victimhood of having been brought into this world against our will, surrounded by people who make the world a worse place even if we don't. Although it's more likely we will also leave a trail of suffering and destruction behind us. Pretty sure that's a bigger issue than what you or I have any control over. This is what it wants. What do you mean? I asked, remembering how he had uttered identical words earlier. This is exactly what it's hungry for. 
he said as the ambulance headlights floated towards us from down the street. This house, you don't get it. This place feeds off of misery like a lacewing fly does honeydew. It's been a good house to live in since I've been here. What do you hate about it? You'd never understand. You moved from out of state to a residence that you knew nothing about, not knowing that you always inherit the memories of an abode that you spend time in. You dismissed the ancients as fools for practicing feng shui, not caring about the wisdom of their ways. This place you call home is so much tragedy attached to it that you must be intuitively tone deaf to not feel it. I heard footsteps behind me and the sound of a gurney lowered. Radio traffic filtered in the background, and I heard the voices of the team as they moved up my steps. The man stood up. He struck my hands away from his wrist and sat on the bench. He bent down and grabbed a knife before he thrust it into his chest. Why do you think he picked your property to end his life? Edwards asked, his expression sour. I found out about who he was. I had never met the man before, but we had something in common. We were both practitioners of magic. I could hear the detectives shuffling their feet beneath the table. This sort of reaction was one that I was used to. Disbelief and mockery. But I appreciated them at least trying to stifle their laughter. Explain. How did you figure out what his belief system is? I talked to the person who owned my home before me. He shared a lot of tales about what has happened in that space. Good and bad, but just mostly bad. Three families came and went through that house before me. Let me tell you who they were. The first family moved into that house in 1976, which was the year the place was built. The father was a musician and writer and the woman was in healthcare. They had a boy, a six-year-old. The newspaper clippings that I was able to download a PDF copy of stated that the woman and child were found butchered in the main hallway on the first floor on March 1st of that year. The story was overshadowed by another famous family annihilator in the media, Bradford Bishop. The second family did not move into the place until 1987, since it took a while for the general public to forget about the horror that had happened there 11 years prior. This particular group of people were not from California but from the Midwest, and the father was much more conservative with a buzz cut and a notorious reputation as a bully amongst his peers. He was a gun store clerk. Unfortunately, that is also the method he used to end the lives of everybody that he claimed to love. A note was found by police under the floorboards, one stating that the house's architect was a self-described warlock who had infused a curse into the ether of the place. The third family was known as the Morovs. They'd purchased the place back in 1998. They were a respected and hardworking family who came from the oil industry. The son survived when their father decided to leave the earth and take everything with him. The man of the house walked into the residence with a shotgun and caused a scene of terror. The son had managed to escape the onslaught by hiding under a rolled up blanket in the attic behind numerous unopened boxes from their move. The son would grow up to be the man who showed up on my porch that night. The reason that I got into the aerospace field is because of Jack Parsons, I said as I leaned back and folded my arms. My interest in magic is proportional to my initial inspiration for being in this industry. Judge me all you want and call me a crackpot and see if I care. There are different kinds of practices in necromancy than this world, whether you want to believe them or not. I never want to cause harm. I don't think the man on the porch that night did either, except to himself. He wanted to ensure that what happened to his family would never occur there again. In this world of what you refer to as magic, Detective Edward said, why would what he did have any kind of positive outcome on this so-called haunting or curse which turns people into maniacs? Extreme self-sacrifice is celebrated in some form or another in almost every culture. The world of the unseen is no different. That man did what he needed to cleanse the place since blood is the ultimate sacred force. 
The makeshift altar he created was to counteract the original hacks. That sounds insane, Detective Vegas said as he stood and paced. I could tell that he was holding back his rage since he was hoping for something that could tie things together nicely in his little report. But I could not offer anything of truth. Yes, but it's also reality. I let my words sink in as Vega reclaimed his seat. The two stared at each other and Edwards nervously tapped his pen against a legal pad. We noticed that you haven't been staying at the house since we had asked if we could search it, Vega said. You could have returned weeks ago, but you've chosen to stay at a hotel six miles away. Why? Because although the place has been given a karmic overload, I don't know who I became the last time that I was there. Intrusive thoughts overtook me. There's a chance that they wouldn't bother me anymore, but they scarred me enough to where I don't want to risk going back and suffering the same interior monologue brought about by the energy there. You see, I want to believe the place is okay now. I'm going to put it up for sale. Everything I left behind is there for the taking. I will never return.